So Deleuze wants us to become animals, or wants us to engage in animal becomings, not in the sense of imitating animals, not in the sense of playing an animal in a, in a, on stage, but in the sense of truly identifying with all those with, with all that non-human expression as if it was a raw material for our works of art. Now, of course, we can use also human expressivity in our works of art. Humans express many things that animals don't express. Think, for instance, of solidarity in a community. Solidarity in a community can be expressed, of course, by words. You, I can say to members of my community, I love you people, I'm with you 100%. But solidarity in a community is expressed much more by actions, helping others on an everyday basis, showing up at the soup kitchen when there's a, when there's a strike and the workers need you there. Actions speak louder than words. And Deleuze was very aware that the expressivity of behavior, the expressivity of what you do, transcended and went beyond anything that we can say with words. In fact, for Deleuze, as for me, as many others, Talk is cheap. You can say anything you want to, but what matters is what you do and the way you express your solidarity in a community or your solidarity with a community of artists or solidarity with a community or in, a, in a demonstration for political rights by being there and by acting in a coherent way. He also talked about expressions of legitimacy. Expressions of legitimacy can, of course, vary in, a, in, in, in all kinds of ways, whether it's the legitimacy of a nation state, in which case it becomes flags, anthems, marchings, and so on, the, the legitimacy of a religion, in which it becomes elaborate ceremonies and rituals full of color and smell of incense, and, and, uh, and you know, uh, song and color. And we can, as artists, of course, also take legitimacy, solidarity, and other forms of human expression as our raw materials. But what is important for Deleuze is that we do not draw a sharp line between the two, that we see a continuum, that we see in those expressions also praises of life, and that we learn to hate those expressions, for instance, of militarism, or those expressions of hatred, ethnic hatred, or those expressions which deny life. We do not have, which do not affirm life. Now there's another way of tackling the question of expressivity, and let me just try to keep myself in time here. There, was, there is a, an important psychologist of animal perception, his name is James, James Gibson. I'm not sure that the list was ever familiar with him. James Gibson was very interested in knowing how animals perceive their environment and how animals perceive their ecosystems. And he invented the word affordance. It's a neologism, but what it means is this. The opportunities and risks that the environment, whether it's geological or biological, the opportunities and risks that the environment affords an animal or supplies an animal with or provides an animal with. For instance, a piece of solid ground affords an animal a surface to walk. And an animal doesn't need to have the concept walking on ground to know in its muscular intelligence that the ground is supplying it with a surface to walk. The moment the animal reaches the edge of a lake and sees that its paws sink, it knows that the lake doesn't afford it, doesn't supply it with a surface to walk. So James Gibson, what he's trying to tell us is the environment expresses its capacities to affect us and to be affected by us. And animals come to perceive those expressions. A cluttered environment full of rocks and so on affords an animal a walking opportunity, but only in some directions. A cliff affords an animal risk, the risk of falling down. And those rocks down there, those pointy rocks down on the cliff, afford an animal the risk of piercing its flesh. All of the environment is expressing the opportunities and risks that is offering an animal. Normal animals walk not at the edge of a cliff, they know they afford them a risk, they walk a safe distance. Because they are, they are, they are queued up to the expressivities of their environment. 
a hole of the right size on the size of a mountain affords a running rabbit a place to hide. But it may also afford a fox a place to hide in order not to be seen by the rabbit and to catch it, you know, uh, by surprise. The, rat, the fox itself affords danger to the rabbit, and the rabbit itself affords an oppor a nutritional opportunity to the fox. Affordances, of course, can also be social. The, the, the architecture itself is all in a way about those surface layouts which express to the users the opportunities and risks that a particular building supplies them with. Solid walls afford me an obstacle, but also afford me privacy from onlookers outside. A door affords me passage. A hallway affords me connectivity to go to other rooms. It's almost as if architects had learned from natural environments to construct surface layouts that immediately express to a human user the, the potentialities for action that that particular surface layout, that particular structure space supplies me with. So when James Gibson is talking to us about seeing affordances directly, about how animal perception is directly queued up to what the environment expresses, what he's basically telling us is that we are all surrounded by, by, by this non-human expressivity and that our very actions are indeed uh, uh, adapted to that non-human expressivity. Another thing that Deleuze touches on a lot, because again, he's trying to get away from verbal expression. Verbal expression is indeed very important, and particularly when it's done by poets or by novelists. Routine verbal expression tends to become almost boring, but you can inject energy into language to make it much more expressive. But what, he, what Deleuze is trying to tell us is, yes, of course we can do that. But there are many other ways in which we can express ourselves without language. And so he tries to then focus on different aspects of the human body and different, different aspects of human behavior. For instance, he concentrates a lot on the human face. The human face is one of those very poorly studied entities. It's 30 or 40 or so muscles capable of about 1,000 to 2,000 different expressions, from regular expressions of sadness, fear, joy, to, to gross uh, expressions that I can just, you know, that, that are allowed and, and that allow you to express even feelings that may not even be the natural feelings of humanity. The human face, according to the list, stabilizes language. Language, we can get a, away with a lot of ambiguities in language because we are stabilizing the meaning of our words with our faces. In a conversation, for instance, we must be facing one another because, of course, it is the face that it is, that it is relating every member of the conversation in addition to the words. If one member of the conversation becomes scared and all of a sudden there's an expression of fear in his face, everybody else turns around to see what that person is seeing because the very ex expression of fear in the face is already expressing a possible world. No one can see right now what I am being afraid of, but my face with that dramatic gesture has expressed everything without expressing, without utilizing a single word. The hands. Italians are, of course, masters of expressivity with their hands. They move in, in an almost operatic way, and they inject expressivity into their, into their already very expressive language by movements of the hands and by, by, by the kind of choreography of, 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 the, of the hands that they, as a culture, apparently have developed up to the optimal point. The body. The body is typically included in our theories as the kind of token material entity. Everything is text, everything is language, everything is metaphor, but then there is the body. But of course, choreographers know that you can make an incredibly expressive use of the body without using a single word. 